This video is going to cover the seven types of discrete random variables tested on exam P. For each of the distributions covered, we're going to go over how easy it is to learn, how likely it is to appear on the exam, and where you can find your free practice questions for each of the distributions. So with that, let's get started. This video continues from where we left off in the last video. To really master the exam concepts, you will need hands-on experience with computational problems, and that's why I recommend the actual Nexus. As the creator of the platform and the exam P instructor, my job here is to help you pass exam P efficiently and affordably. So if you want access to hundreds of relevant practice questions, mock exams, analytics, and so much more, check out the link in the description below. You'll be supporting this channel as well, so thank you and let's get started. Starting off simple, the first distribution is the discrete uniform distribution. The discrete uniform distribution assigns equal probability to each outcome of x. So an example would be rolling a fair six-sided dice. The distribution takes two parameters, a and b, where a is the minimum and b is the maximum. So in this example, a would be 1, b would be 6, and the support would be the numbers 1 through 6. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Sometimes you'll see n used as a parameter as well, where n is defined as the range of possible values. So for a uniform distribution, the idea is that every outcome has equal probability. So if there are n outcomes, then the probability of each outcome is 1 over n. So the PMF of the discrete uniform distribution is just 1 over n. For all the discrete random variables, we can derive the CDF, the expected value, the variance, the second moment, and the standard deviation from the PMF. On the is it easy scale, relative to other distributions, this one is one of the easiest ones. And that's because it's fairly intuitive. The formulas aren't too complicated to memorize, and there aren't many special properties around this distribution. So there's only so many ways the exam can ask questions on it. Will it be tested? Just as a general preface, all of these distributions are on the syllabus, so they all have a chance to appear on the exam. That said, the discrete uniform distribution relative to the other distributions has a lower chance to appear on the exam. The exam is more focused on the continuous uniform distribution, which we'll cover in a later video. Quick tip. The methodology to calculate the properties here is the same for all distributions. So we're not going to derive each of these properties in this video. And for the exam, you're definitely going to want to memorize some of these properties, especially the PMF, the expected value, and the variance. If you memorize the variance and the expected value, you can easily get back to the second moment. The standard deviation is just going to be the square root of the variance, so it's somewhat redundant to memorize the standard deviation. The next distribution is the Bernoulli distribution, which is named after this guy, Mr. Jacob Bernoulli. So apparently he also discovered the constant E, which is also known as Euler's number, but it was discovered by Jacob Bernoulli. And that got me clicking on list of things named after Leon... Leonard Euler. Leonard, Leonard Euler. And this guy's got like 11 numbers named after him, which kind of seems like a big deal. 11 numbers and zero probability distributions, so... I guess we got that going for our buddy Jake. All right, so what is the Bernoulli distribution? The Bernoulli distribution can only take on two values, one with probability p and zero with probability of one minus p. The expected value is calculated as the weighted average of your values with your probabilities, which for the Bernoulli distribution is just equal to p. The second raw moment is also p, and the variance comes out to p times quantity 1 minus p. Just real quick, these tables are meant to be like cheat sheets, and I'll leave a link in the description below where you can download all of these. The reason I mentioned this is because in the tables, you might see a shorthand notation for the CDF. A properly defined CDF must be defined for all real values. So with the shorthand notation, it's implied that the CDF is 0 on the lower end and 1 on the upper end. Another thing to note is that since the CDF must be defined for all real values, and real values are continuous, to get from a discrete PMF to a CDF that's defined for all real values, you have to define intervals for the values that x can take on in the CDF. So just want to add that point of clarification should you download the visuals. In terms of is it easy, the Bernoulli distribution is relatively easy compared to the other distributions. So it gets a 5 out of 5 in terms of easiness. Will it be tested? This gets a 1 out of 5 because there aren't that many SOA sample questions on it. But keep in mind that the Bernoulli distribution is a building block for other distributions. So when you test other distributions, you're also somewhat testing the Bernoulli distribution. The next distribution is the binomial distribution. The binomial distribution can be thought of as the sum of n independent Bernoulli distributions, all with probability of success p. Sometimes you'll see lowercase x instead of lowercase k. They both represent the same thing. 
Each of the trials in a binomial distribution is independent. And so from independent events and the multiplication rule, which we covered in the first video, the probability of all k independent events occurring is simply the product of their individual probabilities. So in this case, p multiplied by itself k times, or p raised to the k. Similarly, since there are k successes, there must be n minus k failures, and the probability of failure is 1 minus p. So the probability of n minus k failures all occurring is 1 minus p raised to the n minus k. Finally, we multiply these probabilities together and also multiply by the binomial coefficient n choose k. The reason we apply n choose k is because the binomial distribution doesn't specify the order in which the k successes and n minus k failures occur. And so to account for the different combinations, we multiply by n choose k. The CDF for a binomial distribution doesn't have a simple closed form solution. So when calculating the CDF, you'll probably have to start with the PMF and sum up the individual results to get to the CDF number. The expected value is n times p and the variance is n times p times quantity 1 minus p. You definitely want to know these by heart. And also in the last video, we went through an example using the binomial distribution. Is it easy? The binomial distribution gets a 4 out of 5. It's not the most difficult to understand, and it's fairly intuitive. Will it be tested? There's a really high chance that you'll get at least one question on the binomial distribution. There are so many things that the exam can ask about it. So for will it be tested, the binomial distribution gets a 5 out of 5. The geometric distribution is also built off the Bernoulli distribution. The geometric distribution models the number of failures until a success. There are two ways to define x, or sometimes you'll see k in the geometric distribution. The first way is where x equals the number of trials, so that includes the number of failures plus the success. The second way is where x just equals the number of failures. The exam questions are computational, so they more so test your understanding of the topics and how you can apply them. So it's rare that the question's going to pigeonhole you into using one version of the distribution versus the other. If a question on the geometric distribution comes up, you'll most likely use the one that you're familiar with. The numerical number that you calculate using either version should come out to be the same. With the geometric distribution, you're failing x minus 1 times until finally you get one success. So the PMF is 1 minus p raised to the x minus 1 times p. If you use the typical formulas to derive the expected value, you'll get 1 over p. You may want to try that exercise on your own. For the exam, I would just memorize this. And the variance is 1 minus p divided by p squared. And then the CDF is uh, 1 minus quantity, 1 minus p raised to the x. Is it easy? Similar to the binomial distribution, this one gets a 4 out of 5. Overall, it's a relatively straightforward distribution. Will it be tested? This one's straight down the middle with a 3 out of 5. There aren't too many SOA sample questions on it, but you definitely don't want to rule this one out. The negative binomial distribution is also built off the Bernoulli distribution. This distribution models k failures before the rth success. Huh, so it turns out the negative binomial distribution is named after Mr. Negative Binomial. That, no. The negative binomial distribution is also known as the Pascal distribution. So looking at the PMF, by now it might seem like the Bernoulli, the geometric, the binomial, and the negative binomial all sort of follow the same structure of a PMF, where p raised to a number represents the number of successes, and 1 minus p raised to another number represents the number of failures. The negative binomial is also multiplied by k plus r minus 1, choose k. If we think of the rth success as fixed, because that's when you know to stop the trials, then there are r minus 1 successes and k failures before the rth success. And so so the number of combinations of r minus 1 successes and k failures is k plus r minus 1, choose k. The expected value and variance, I would just memorize these for the exam. Is it easy? This one gets a 3 out of 5. By definition of the distribution, it seems a little more complicated than the geometric, which we gave a 4, so this one gets a 3 out of 5. Will it be tested? This distribution is not super popular, like the binomial, but it's also not entirely obscure, so right down the middle, 3 out of 5. So moving on from the negative binomial distribution, we now have the hypergeometric distribution. So right off the bat, you might notice that the PMF of the hypergeometric distribution looks different than the PMF for the previous few distributions we looked at. The main reason for that is because the hypergeometric distribution is based on sampling without replacement, and before the distributions were based on sampling with replacement. With replacement means that if you select from a sample, you basically put your selection back in. And because of that, the probability of success doesn't change because it's basically like you were never there. So because we're sampling without replacement, there's no P here because P is not constant trial over trial. Instead, we use a series of binomial coefficients to represent the PMF for a hypergeometric distribution. The hypergeometric distribution takes on three parameters. So capital K, capital N, and a lowercase n. 
Capital K is the number of successes in your overall population. Capital N is the total number of trials in your overall population. And lowercase n is the number of trials you're sampling. And so the PMF tells us the probability of lowercase k, which is the number of successes out of lowercase n. So let's take a look at the PMF to see how this works in terms of binomial coefficients. So when we looked at previous distributions with replacement, such as the binomial distribution, we can multiply the probabilities together because the trials are independent. When you sample without replacement, the trials are no longer independent because what you sampled in the previous trial affects the next trial. However, with the hypergeometric distribution, the first coefficient samples from the population of successes and the second samples from the population of failures. So those two populations are independent and that's why you can multiply the coefficients together. And so putting it all together, this formula basically tells you how many ways are there to sample successes how many ways are there to sample failures divided by how many ways are there to just draw lowercase n from uppercase n. And that gives you the probability of the number of successes lowercase k. The see if there's no simple closed form solution. Once you understand how the distribution works, the expected value makes sense. So it's basically the probability of successes in your population, which is uppercase k divided by uppercase n. And then you take that probability and multiply by your sample size, and that gets you the expected number of successes in your sample. The formula for the variance is a little more involved. I would probably leave this as one of the last things to memorize. Is it easy? I would give this a 3 out of 5 leaning towards 2.5 out of 5. If you have a good understanding of combinations from learning objective one, then it might be easier for you to pick up the concepts for hypergeometric distributions. If you struggle with combinatorics, then it might be more difficult. Will it be tested? This gets a four out of five. The concepts overlap with learning objective one. So while you may not necessarily get a question that states this is a hypergeometric distribution, you may use some of the principles from this distribution to solve those types of questions. All right, the last and final discrete distribution, Poisson. Poisson. Nailed it. The Poisson distribution models the number of events occurring in a given interval. It takes on one parameter, lambda, which is the average number of events occurring within that interval. So you may notice that the interval itself is not a parameter, and that's not involved in the mathematical calculations. So on exam P, the problems will probably state, you know, within a certain interval, or not even mention the specific time interval. Since we define lambda as the expected value of the distribution, the expected value is lambda, which is pretty nice. What's not nice is the PMF, which is this crazy looking formula. Lambda at first glance, this formula looks pretty whack, and it just seems like some people threw some numbers together. And I wouldn't put it past Euler to sneak his number in there. Fortunately, there is a logical derivation of this formula. You can derive this formula from the binomial distribution as n approaches infinity and p approaches zero. But if your goal is to get through the exam, I would just memorize this and call it a day. The Poisson distribution also has some nice properties. The mean is lambda and the variance is also lambda, so that's easy to remember. And the sum of independent Poisson variables is also Poisson, and that's also on the syllabus. So you'll definitely want to get some practice with that. Is it easy? The Poisson distribution gets a 2 out of 5. I think it's the most challenging of the discrete distributions, and the formulas can get a little messy, especially if you're doing CDF calculations, so there's more room for error. Will it be tested? This gets a 5 out of 5. The sum of independent Poisson variables is listed on the syllabus, so you may get questions on that topic in addition to questions on the regular Poisson distribution. Earlier, I promised you free questions. Here they are. I'll leave a link to the visual in the description below. You can also access more questions on the actualnexus.com. If you're watching this in 2024, the first 30 questions of your choosing are completely free, so you may want to take advantage of that while you still can. That's a wrap for this video. Thanks for watching. If you want to support the channel, leave a like, and I'll see you in the next video.